respected <coughs> teachers and uh, students of the college it's a great uh, opportunity and uh, privilege to come and greet you on this occasion of uh, this literary and uh, film festival uh, we the people uh, litwenza 2020 and i all heartily appreciate this great endeavor and this mode of cultural resistance that uh, you are into i have witnessed the book fair and we have all visited the artistic expressions of students and teachers there and i greatly appreciate it it is a it's a wonderful and timely uh, act of resistance and articulation against uh, the growing intolerance and violence in the country today which has uh, assumed a pseudo majoritarian and uh, pro fascist kind of mobility in the country so it is in this context that uh, we are discussing about the literatures of the people or the uh, cultural uh, articulations of the people the bahujans the majority of people in the country the common people they are termed as bahujans which is a word used 2600 years before by one of the greatest uh, uh, thinkers and visionaries of the world uh, like the buddha buddha used that word bahujan bahujan hitaya and bahujan sukhaya for the welfare and uh, the common good of the people that is my philosophy said the buddha so that words of wisdom of the buddha that is very contemporary and significant in the present when the cultural elitisms and exclusionary discourses they are termed as the hegemonic discourses in the country the hegemonic discourse in the country we must have identified then only we can effectively resist it so there is no doubt that the hegemonic the concept itself is from antonio gramsci as you know as students of literature and culture and the critical humanities it is taken from the italian thinker the 20th century italian philosopher and uh, political thinker antonio gramsci so he used the term hegemony or hegemony uh, to refer to a cultural consensus as against direct political or economic mode of exploitation he has provided the cultural turn in the left the neo left by kelly and barry anderson and others as we know the new left review and all so that cultural turn was made possible by the critical intervention of the thought of antonio gramsci in early 20th century at the wake of european fascism the classical fascism that we are discussing now but one thing we must remember is that even the classical fascist benito mussolini of italy or uh, adolf hitler of germany even they have taken inspiration from the indian fascists so the indian fascism or brahmanism as it is termed as uh, uh, by scholars like ambedkar for example so from ambedkar to marxist uh, historians like dd kosambi who is who was, who was born in a brahman community himself they have termed it as the most hegemonic and the most anti human most inequal kind of graded inequality in the whole world so that is one thing we must all identify and recognize if you cannot call a spade a spade you cannot resist it so first you have to identify and understand and name it and by naming it you can start resisting it so baba sahab for example he has written multiple volumes on this graded inequality in the country 
it is one of the most perverted power structures in the world and that is the hegemony of india which is called the indian ideology with marxist like perry anderson they have written works on the indian ideology this is the indian ideology it is otherwise called the the hindu vedic system it is called the hindu colonialism for example internal imperialism we must acknowledge and realize the depth and gravity of this inequality which has divided the country which has made this kind of inhuman situations in the country so the roots are the in the brahmanical vedic system which is called the sanatana vedic uh, smriti shruti puranas of india that is the textuality of this internal imperialism the textuality of the internal imperialism is the smriti shruti purana tradition starting from the vedas so it is in the vedas that uh, you have the purusha sutta that created this inequal patriarchal and uh, priestly form of hegemony in india so hegemony as kamchi has explained us is not direct domination but it is a cultural consensus it is a rule by consent even the victims are complicit in it the victims cannot challenge it because they don't identify it as a power structure they consider it as normal normative and natural and the way of the world and also it is given through cultural conditioning in the society so that it is uh, it is believed as it is perceived and normalized as religion in the social structures so this is the complexity of the issue of hegemony in india so this hegemony this vedic obscurantism the discourse of purusha sutta and the veda and uh, this manusmriti in particular that creates different laws for the different varnas or jatis in the country the purusha sutta divides the people into the chaturvarnya system the four fold varnas you know in the rigvedic purusha sutta it is said that the human beings are born from the body of the the cosmic body which is called the vidat purusha the god of the hindus it is uh imagined as a purusha and that purusha is called the virat purusha or brahma purusha and the purusha gives birth to the human kinds not all human kinds but only these fourfold uh kinds or fourfold varnas or the chatur varnis they are called the brahman kshatriya vaishya and shudra these are the four varnas mentioned as human uh who are born from the body of the purusha from the various bodily organs of the purusha when mahatma phule the pioneer of indian social uh, renaissance in maharashtra in early 19th century when he was uh pointed out when he was asked about this vedic purusha sutta story he retorted uh, then the the virat purusha might be having a a genital organ within the mouth otherwise how can the brahmans come through the mouth of the virat purusha that was the rational question raised by phule jyotiba phule or uh, jyotirao govindrao phule the pioneer of social uh, renaissance in, in western india who paved the foundation for the ambedkarite movement and who also paved the foundation for women's education in india by educating his own wife savitri bai phule he made uh, a, a one of the first lady teachers of india in early 1840s 1840s they started the schools for dalit girls in maharashtra and they were supported by their good friends and neighbors uh, sahira sheik and uh, salman sheik and that is how they have pioneered the indian education revolution satri bai phule the today the women's university in pune is named after uh, kranti jyoti satri bai phule because of the support that was given by sahira shaikh 
and Salman Sheikh. So that kind of camaraderie against caste, that kind of solidarity and fraternity, as Baba Sahib argues, educate, agitate and organize and also you must uh, uh, talk in terms of education. You have to have this fraternity first, then only you can talk about liberation and democracy and uh, greater other common goods and goals. So liberty, equality, fraternity. Fraternity is the basis of all these uh, educational and uh, what you call cultural struggles. That is a lesson that we can imbibe from Phule and Savitri Bai and uh, Sahira Sheikh and Salman Sheikh and their fraternity that made possible the Indian social revolution and the uh, renaissance in Western India. So that kind of fraternity is the need of the hour. So that's why to fight this Indian hegemony or the Vedic Parnashrama Dharma project, which is the, uh, what you call the foundation of uh, the, the, the caste system in India. This Varnashrama Dharma has de degraded into the caste system in India. The degraded, most wretched kind of system in India. This has created Rohit Vemulas and other victims. You know, even in IITs today, our students are unable to go and uh, complete their courses. The very name, even a Muslim name, is not acceptable in the higher academia, in the supreme institutions of education and technology in India today. This is the situation. Because we forget, because we don't uh, nourish this fraternity, because we are not seeing human beings as human, and because we are all degraded and dehumanized totally by the inhuman caste system the most wretched system of fascism anywhere in the world, the, the apartheid system of India, the Indian ideology. This is Varnashrama Dharma or the caste Hindu system, the caste Hindu system that is the internal realism of India. So from Phule, from the Buddha, Buddha was the first one, the first indigenous voice to challenge this system. Even Gay Longnet, the foreign lady, uh, the white woman, Gay Longwat, who came here to study about Baba Sahib, she has written that book, Buddhism, uh, Challenge to Brahmanism and Caste, Buddhism in India, uh, Challenging Brahmanism and Caste, that is the book that Gay Longwat has written. So, we forget these legacies of anti-caste movement, but Ambedkar reminds us about this legacy. So, that is why he acknowledged the Buddha, Kabir, the Sufi poet and uh, mystic, and also Mahatma Phule himself as uh, his great teachers. They are my masters, my great gurus, acknowledged the America. So we must also acknowledge this anti caste legacy of India and fight this caste Hindu imperialism of our times, or this caste Hindu fascism, which is the most. Uh, uh, heinous crime against humanity in the whole world, even the classical fascists, as I told you, they took inspiration from the Indian fascists. That is why in Kerala Renaissance, Sahodan Ayyappan, about whom I have a book, which, is, which I found outside with uh, delight, uh, Sahodan has reminded us that compared to uh, Hitler, uh, compared to our Manu, Compared to the Manu who wrote, who codified the Hindu law, the Hindu Brahmanical double speak, uh, their Hitler is a naive and innocent person. That is the comparison that uh, Sahodana Yepan has made. Compared to Manu, our Manu, Manu of India, who wrote the Manusmurti, the black book of uh, the land, the heinous caste justice of the Brahmanical law. We have plenty of translations of Manusputi. You have John Bahala and plenty of others. Max Muller to Bahala, John Bahala and others have translated. You can read it and find out what is the justice given to uh, the people in Manusputi. Shudra Vachara Samyuktam, 
ദുരേ പരിവർജ്യതി നസ്ത്രീ സ്വാതന്ത്ര്യമർഹതി ദീസ് ആർ ദി ദി എഡിക്സ് ഓഫ് മൻ വിമൻ ആർ നോട്ട് വേർത്തി ഓഫ് ലിബറേഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഫ്രീഡം ദ ശൂദ്രാസ് ഹു ആർ ദി സപ്പോസ് ടു ബി ദ ഫോർത്ത് വർണ്ണ ഹു ആർ ബോൺ ഔട്ട് അക്കോർഡിംഗ് ടു ദ വേദിക് പുരുഷ സൂത്ത ഹു ആർ ബോൺ ഔട്ട് ഓഫ് ദ ഫീറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദ വിരാട് പുരുഷ they are the menial slave of the other three fold varnas the tri varnikas and they should not be given education those who learn they must be killed or those who listen mortal lead must be poured into their ears or those who articulate the letters of the alphabet like bhagai lapachan talking about no not a letter is seen on my rays no alphabet in sight that is another translation a gathering thank you so those who learn this art of letters and those who articulate and teach they must be killed by uh, beheading that is what shambhuga experienced that is what ram the lord of the hindus the incarnation of vishnu ram did to shambhuga that is the punishment according to manasu to save the caste varna system to save varnashrama ram beheaded shambhuga who did nothing else but he educated himself and he meditated and he tried to be uh, a sage or a muni unfortunately he was killed killed by the lord himself to save this varnashrama dharma system this caste barbarism of it this is the the rootedness of the this is the, the the seriousness of the issue so this system denies humanity and educational and other cultural rights to the people so that is why the system is not acceptable uh, according to any sort of justice or any sort of reason or any common sense nobody can accept this in equal system of varnashrama dharma which is the foundation of the caste greater inequality in this country so we need to totally critique and reject and uh, uh, completely annihilate this system of caste in india that is the fight that uh, i trace from buddha to kabir to sufis and uh, the mystics and uh, the modern rationalists in india and also it is the the function of the minor religions also in india who are also fighting the caste system that is why even narayana guru uh, in 1914 he accepted the contribution of colonial modernity colonialism is a political and economic kind of exploitation but it has also got certain other important uh, liberative kind of effects in india because india was a caste society that is why in a caste society like india were 90% of people were subjected to this kind of inequality their humanity is what was in question they were not even accepted as full fledged human beings because only these trivarnigas have full fledged humanity only the trivarnigas brahman kshatriya vaishya they have educational rights even the last fourth varna shudra is denied education and uh, full fledged freedom according to the manusmriti and other smriti shruti puranas the manu dharma shastras can shri ram and mayavati political leaders they used to talk about earlier they used to talk about the manu dharma shastras and the manuvadis but unfortunately today they are all being silenced somehow in one way or the other all the voices are being silenced what happened to tel tumbade or what happened to k satyanarayana who edited that no alphabet in sight along with uh, susi tharu you know they are all silenced but what is happening to our own kids those who are into reading and writing those who are into critical debates uapa that is charming instead and those who resist the hinduization of uh, kerala renaissance as in narayana guru those aged people aged kind of writers and public speakers who resisted the parivar and rss agenda of hinduizing the kerala renaissance they the box so is charged against them this is the unfortunate situation 
into which we have all fallen into we are already into it but we cannot rest till the very last we have to articulate persistence so that is why till the very last we need to speak truth we need to speak for justice that is the function that is the function of a human being in current indian context so that is why we need to critique and resist this in human system and we need to continue our cultural and democratic struggles our educational struggles our cultural struggles that is why these kind of festivals festivals of resistance festivals of letters festivals of cinema festivals of literature and culture these are very important and timely and uh, i'm really glad that the college and its faculty and its uh, uh, very socially aware teachers and uh, the student community you have come up uh, you have risen up to the occasion and you have uh, emerged with this uh, very contemporary kind of a festival and also the rare festivals coming up in our neighborhood in many colleges these kinds of uh, festivals are emerging it's a uh, it's a it's a hope and uh, it is a very uh, promising kind of knot that we are into so till the very last we need to continue the fight and the resistance uh, so let us come in come to my own topic which is uh, about new literatures and counter hegemonic discourses in the context of the present ground realities in india it is of course the new literatures that can counter this communalization of the public sphere and uh, what you call the uh, the modification of the cultural sphere it is definitely the literatures from the people the literatures in plural uh, i have put it in plural because there are several streams of literatures emerging in the present there are literatures from the margins who are attacking the centralizing forces or the hegemonic centralized presences these literatures are emerging from the most downtrodden people the most disprivileged people in the country today that is why the fight of uh, chandrashekhar ravan that is very important ravan ki jai that is the slogan that is uh that is uh, booming in the country today that is resonating in every nook and cranny of india today ravan ki jai not the old ravan but the new ravan chandrashekhar azad azad ravan so that kind of resistance it is coming from the most disprivileged sections the untouchables of india that is the issue. even today blacks and lacks of untouchables are carrying the the excreta of the caste hindus people are dying in the man holes even even yesterday and a few days before that news came people are dying in the in the scavenging business in the in the, the man holes in the dirty holes they are taking the shit of others as in rp amudan's uh, you may be aware of that document the shit uh or that uh, vidya bharati's documentary theetam or kakus you know that system this is the most uh, uh, uh what it called shameful kind of uh varnashrama so dharma this is legitimized as dharma if you follow varnashrama dharma the indian hegemonic system this is your caste duty or this is your caste calling this is dharma varnashrama annual scavenge this is the 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 caste hindu system the dirt the nasty stench of the caste system in our society this is reality so it's killing people it is suffocating the whole social fabric in india this is the inhuman system so it is coming from these disenfranchised people so it is coming from the dalits of india from the adivasis of india from the women of india from the minorities of india 
from the other what you call contested sections like the transsexuals of india so they are all contesting and competing the big claims of hindutva and the shining india figure which began with uh, vajpayee and uh, mm joshi and mohan mahajan and all in early 21st century it began but we never recognize the the reality and the atrocity of this system that is why most of us were silent about this caste hindu system coming to power making a mockery of the indian democratic parliamentary system and the indian constitution and eventually what happened in 2018 and 19 our constitution itself got dismantled abrogated not just the uh, the what you call demonetization and the federal issue article 370 that uh, is being abrogated but the very constitution and its ethics the foundations of our constitutional ethics and morality got destabilized tampered and done with and only the cover we have only the preamble and the 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 what you call the binding the out of cover it's uh, it has become a hollow vacuum shell and it is being appropriated totally by the pro fascist forces who assert into power through communalizing the whole social fabric in india so we need to be aware of this we need to articulate we need to name it we need to only by naming you can resist it. you cannot resist what is there in vacuum you have to identify the problems you have to correct your mistakes it's also a self critical kind of conjecture so we need to rethink and relook into our silences silence means death in the present in fascist times you need to continuously raise these issues you need to keep alive the debate on indian hegemony or the caste hindu society and the graded inequality and the immensity of inequality and exclusion in the country that is what all the commissions in india earlier before the coming of uh, age of indian fascists and all the commissions they have pointed out the exclusion the immensity of exclusion mandal commission for example and the counter mandal the forces of the caste into system they have initiated the kamandal and the mandirai session drill that is how they have destroyed the uh, the, the, the babri masjid for example that is how they have initiated the rathayatra sadwani and uh, mm joshi and uh, vajpayee and others and when they came to power in early 2000s they got uh, somebody from kerala and made him the ichr chairman the indian council for historical research and he was made the chairman from kerala and he officiated the saffronization of the hindu textbooks this is how the real hegemony came into the indian education system the trajectory of the nep it begins from the inception of the rss in the 1920s even before that from the Bengal Renaissance itself, this kind of otherizing ultra-nationalism was booming against uh, uh, the colonial rule. But once you get the liberation, independence, the nationalism must give way to your democratic, constitutional democracy. But unfortunately, in places like India, that ultra-nationalism, that otherizing nationalism, the xenophobic nationalism the what you call the what you find in the texts of uh, the bengal writers like arabindo or vivekananda or bangim chandra in particular it has contributed to the consolidation of the hindu chauvinism in the country and it has created the others and outcasts and uh, it is it has been systematically trying to erase the so called outcasts and others of the country so this hinduization of indian society and culture and education 
it is having a long history it's almost more than 100 years old but at least from the modern context or contemporary context we must realize the immensity of it and we must try to resist it in whatever ways possible in whatever spheres possible so this uh, recent hinduization trend has its uh, beginning in the saffronization of history history textbooks in particular and the modification of indian education system and that has culminated in the national educational policy draft of the uh, parivar forces uh, indian nationalist party in recent times in 2016 they have published that draft 2018 and 2019 they have uh, modified further fine tune that uh, uh, draft in favor of the uh, swayam sevak sang advocates and uh, smriti rani javadekar now pokriyal and others they have made it almost complete according to their agenda of hinduization and it is ready perhaps in the next season of parliament it may be passed we we don't know what is going to happen but it it can happen at any moment like demonetization or the abrogation of article 370 or the recent caa it can happen at any moment that can exclude and annihilate its own citizens that kind of a terror this is part of the hindu caste terror this is a an imminent threat that we must be aware of so these literatures that i am talking about the literatures that are emerging from the outcasts and others of the nation it is having pivotal importance in the present in resisting this hegemonic and uh, centralized agenda of hindu nationalism that is why the legacy of dalit literatures in india in both english and also in the regional languages the vernaculars susitaru and others they talk about the vernacular so the vernacular traditions and its diversity and democratic decentering the new dalit literatures emerging in various parts of india in various regional languages the tribal and adivasi writing that is emerging in various parts of india even in english we are having we have our own uh sikh janu writing about her life story the testimonials uh, as told to another writer and then translated into english language so that kind of ancient first nation writing that kind of writing from the indigenous people that kind of new imaginations and visions that can resist the monolith of india the cultural homogenization of india it is possible because it is again a legacy of the the phule savitri bai ambedkar paradigm that is it. the the bahujan tradition that began with the buddha because buddha was the first to question the varnashrama and he was the first to practice the policy of social representation which is the basis of democracy anywhere in the world So that is why Ambedkar said it is from the Buddha and his Sanghas or the democratic order of the sect of the, the monks and nuns that is called the Sangha, Changam or in Tamil it is called Changam. We talk about Changam literature and Changam culture, the Sangham, Sahitya and uh, literature of it. So it is from the Buddha that you have that democratic culture. principle of tradition of inclusion and representation the people especially the people at the bottom and the margins they must be represented in a sangha if you are a democracy if you are a gana the democratic order is called the gana or the sangha so if you want to become democratic you must practice the principle of inclusion and representation there is no democracy without representation 
No democracy is possible without political and social representation. So it is not a charity. The presentation or the reservation systems or the affirmative action program in India is envisioned by Baba Sahib and the founding fathers of our constitution, not as a charity or any generosity, but it is political representation, ensuring political representation, then only we can become a democracy. There is no democracy without social and political representation, especially in a society of social inequality. This much immense created inequality, you cannot talk about democracy unless you don't have a very powerful, very affirmative system of social representation and inclusion. That is the, the foundation that we have in the Buddha. That is why Baba Sahib said in his BBC talk in English that I am taking liberty, equality and fraternity, not just from Magna Carta or the French Revolution, but from my Guru, my Master, the Buddha and his Sangha. Because Sangha was the practice of this democracy, including women. Women were not uh, allowed to get into any educational higher academia till the time of the Buddha, because the Varnashtama Dharma system, this Manismurdi and the uh, Rigvedic Purusha Suttam and the Gita was. Uh, Gita is the iconic text that prevents Varma Sangha. The greatest philosophical issue presented in the Gita, the cause of Arjuna Vishada Yoga or the cause of Arjuna's sadness or melancholy is that if we are killed in the war, what happens to our women? Those people, the so-called others and outcasts, they will come and take our women. So there will be Varna Sangara, mixing of blood, mixing of, uh, breaking of caste endogami. Varna Sangara will happen. This is against Varnashtama Dharma. This is against the Vedic metaphysics and the, the caste Hindu religion. So Varna Sangara will happen. That is the cause of his sadness. Not the dilemma in killing your own brothers and uh, sisters and ancestors and grandfathers and grand uncles. The grandfather, Bhishma, is standing on the other side. But he is not concerned about killing that grandfather and his own half-brother. How he killed that half-brother, Duryodhana. Uh, how Bhima was forced and taught and persuaded by Krishna to kill that Duryodhana by breaking his thighs, that is the, the Achilles of heel, the weakest uh, point of uh, the Yodhana was the actor that was, that, that was of his thighs and he brought that thigh and the God demonstrated to do that. The God teaching to kill, can you imagine? Can any God teach how to kill his own brother, half-brother, cousin, the Yodhana? So this is the most uh, unfortunate situation which is called the hegemonic system of India. The paganism, Baba Sahib described it as the paganism. This paganism is a constant threat to liberty, equality and fraternity in the country. Only when it is annihilated, it can be annihilated. The caste system needs to be annihilated and uh, uh, it is being legitimized by the dominant religious formation in India. Therefore, in order to annihilate the caste, we need to annihilate its uh, religious sanctioning, the religious system that upholds this greater inequality as well. That was the, uh, the well-thought opinion of Baba Sahib. That's why he went into another religious uh, setup itself, the, the conversion we challenge this ultra-nationalism right beneath the nose of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevan Sangh in 1956 in Nagpur. That is the symbolic act, the most iconic act against this ultra-jingoistic totalitarian nationalism in the country. So, uh, we need to talk about this new literatures that are emerging in various parts of India as an Ambedkarite legacy. So it is a literature of uh, democracy, 
It is a literature of anti-caste humanism. It is a literature of uh, anti-pagan, uh, what you call, compassion and ethics that is taught by the Buddha and by the new Buddha that is Ambedkar himself. People are viewing and saluting Baba Sahib as the new Buddha of India because of his uh, compassionate teachings about ethics and uh, democratic principles. So, Dalit literature has emerged as a counter hegemonic discourse, which can challenge the discourse of caste and varna, which can challenge the Brahmanical values itself in the country that is dominating, the Brahmanical corporate kind of capitalism that has engulfed the country. A merging of the corporate powers and also the Brahmanical religious cultural hegemony. That is what you see as if in Italian fascism uh, or in the Nazis uh, kind of Holocaust in Germany. The total merging of capitalist forces and corporate kind of structures and uh, a few communities and a few, few families, you could say. A few families are controlling the wealth of India today, especially after demonetization. What happened to the little and small scale industries and the tiny merchants of our, our villages, you know, you know better than me. So what happened to the Indian, Indian economic system afterwards? Who benefited? So who has accumulated the wealth? A few families, Russell Bank and other agencies, they have their clear statistics. 60 to 70 percent of the wealth of India is now being controlled by a few families, a few family lords. You know about Adani and Ambani and all those things. All the public sectors are being dismantled and disinvested and uh, the resources are now going into the same families, into their three. What happened to BSNL? Uh, some 10,000 people now, they got the VROs Many public uh, sector uh, limiteds and uh, uh, institutions, they are not getting salaries. Even the public funded institutions, they have problems in giving salaries. All the universities in Kerala, most of the public and central universities, even central universities in, in India, they are facing fund cuts and uh, restrictions. And uh, uh, the Hall of Research that is also being after uh, the Rohit Vibula incident and after the protests in JNU and uh, now recently in Jamia and uh, Anigad and all those things, there is a very concerted, vicious attempt from the part of the regime to check the funding and limit the access to resources, even basic internet facilities are being denied to the students what is happening in Kashmir or the Northeast. We must all keep track of these things because tomorrow it will happen to us. So in these serious crisis, situations of crisis, we need to rethink about our social fraternity. We need to develop broader camaraderies and solidarities and fraternities, human fraternity, that is what we need to remember. That is what the Buddha or uh, Christ or the Prophet, they have taught us, or the Sikh Gurus or the Dirthandaras, they have taught us about the importance of being human, the importance of developing fraternity, the importance of developing the greater community and society, we need to rethink about our own problems and uh, disputes. And we need to come together and resist this fascist formation together. We know, divided we fall, only united we can stand and fight again. So, fortunately, the young generation, the young researchers and the university students and also the common people in Delhi, they are showing a way ahead. And we need to unite with them. We need to 
express our fraternity and solidarity with the fighters from those young students to the old grandmas they are sitting in the winter and we need to sit along with them we need to express our solidarity and we need to promote these kind of critical and uh, very academic debates academic and cultural debates in a very critical way in order to refashion and restrength and uh, rejuvenate the cultural uh, rebellions and uh, uh, resistances uh, all across the country so since it is already late i am not talking in detail about these literatures and the counter hegemonic kind of resistance but i am just saluting the good spirit shown by the teachers and students of this college in contributing to uh, this great cultural and democratic uh, struggle the life struggle against uh, uh, the indian hegemony the indian fascism and uh, uh, hope we we see a better tomorrow uh only united we can fight it we need to rejuvenate and we need to recover the lost legacy of the indian constitution the social justice paradigm as i told you that too was broken through kerala unfortunately it happened through kerala and fortunately through the left the indian constitution was suspended by uh doing away its social justice core by infiltrating the economic logic into it but happened in the economic observation in the there was some board that was fatal as far as the legacy of the indian constitution is concerned and after that you know uh, all these abrogations and changes happened and we need to we can fight back we can uh, resist only by recovering the legacy of the indian constitution and its uh, core of social justice so we need to recover the social justice core of indian constitution and revive it back into place and then we can fight the anti democratic uh, tendencies one by one uh, so let it be a new beginning and let's hope for the better in future thank you very much for this opportunity i am presenting only these preliminary remarks before you for your consideration and your own responses i need to listen to you and your responses thank you very much